the lecture will be about uh, Otto Lande Kurz, as, as Rose introduced, and, and the city of Munich. Um, the first part will be more specifically on, on, on the conditions in Munich uh, at those times, or at these times. So what, what, what are the building conditions at the beginning of the 20th century? Because like they have a main impact on the work of Otto Lande Kurz. And uh, after this short introduction on the conditions, we are going over to, to the work of Otto Lande Kurz. So I start right away. So here we see the young architect. He was born in Florence um, in 1881. And he spent a lot of time there until he was 12 years old. He uh, comes out of, of a very, very popular family with a lot of artist's background with uh, uh, his, his aunt uh, was Isolde Kurz. She was a very famous German writer. Uh, from, from her, we, she, she wrote an uh, autobiography about the family and she, uh, yeah, one, one chapter in this book was about uh, Otto Lande Kurz. So from there we have all the, most of the personal information uh, about Otto Lande Kurz. Um, yeah. As he, as he was 12 years old, he moved back to Munich uh, because his father, who was a sculptor, uh, got a new position there. Um, he attended the, the school there and uh, also studied in Munich with a, with a short break in Karlsruhe, but uh, his diploma he did in Munich. What's really curious about Otto Lande Kurz that he was a kind of a, of a generalist. He, he, he was an architect like the ideal architect, he did everything. He did churches, like here, this, this was a church, a very early church in 1914 in St. Otto. Uh, he did uh, factories, he, did, uh, he was part of the, of the high-rise discussion that started after the First World War in Munich. Uh, and that was quite important. Uh, the discussion was opened by Hermann Sergel and uh, he joined, uh, he did a lot of proposals. You, you can see this, this look, uh, the, the, a bit clumsy, uh, the, the approach to the high rise, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was uh, somehow a start. But most uh, of the time he was building residential buildings. So this is uh, how we uh, did to get to know him and I think this, this uh, would be, uh, should be the focus on the second part of the lecture because it's quite interesting uh, what, what uh, uh, yeah, the development he ran through. But first, uh, as I said, we start with the condition in Munich. So uh, in 1814, Munich was, was really uh, like this uh, medieval layout town. You, you can see the fortification walls. Uh, here around the city and you see like the, the central church, the Frauenkirche and the residence and uh, it's, it's like very common as, as many cities uh, in these times in Europe. Um, in 1849 there was a big growth. It, 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 uh, on the one hand it, it comes together with the, with the start of industrialization which really enhanced them till the end of the uh, uh, 19th century. And uh, there, there were uh, a, a lot of building activities. So we have a lot of, of public buildings uh, that has been built uh, in the north by the king um, or by the ruler and uh, a lot of, of transformation into residential buildings because like the, the inner city was too dense and uh, as many other towns, the fortification walls uh, uh, kept, the, the growth, uh, kept the growth down so they have to move outside the walls. And then finally, in 1891, you can see like the main station is now really important for the city, uh, together with, uh, with the uh, growing industrialization. And Munich had a big problem because they didn't know how to, to uh, evolve or to, to enhance the city. As you can see in the north, uh, this is Max Vorstadt. They really used the grid. Um, yeah, and, and this is like like a. There's another effect that, that really comes together with the uh, problem of the, of the development uh, for the city. It's that there's a change in, in the layout of the floor plan. So on the left side, you see uh, a floor plan from 1864, and which is uh, quite obvious that it's, it's, it's like a, deep, a deeper floor plan. And uh, there's a, a dark uh, zone in the middle where all the servants and uh, uh, service rooms 
were uh, positioned. And after a big uh, cholera uh, plague, uh, the Hattenkofer, he's, well, he was a scientist in Munich and he was, was completely concerned about the hygienic aspect of building. He's the one why um, Munich uh, is having a canalization. <laughs> um, he changed or it had such an influence on the building law that they changed uh, the building law uh, according to his, oh, sorry, to his um, rules. So he said that every room uh, has to have access to uh, natural lighting and fresh air. So as you can see here, those rooms that uh, have been uh, before in the inner zone of the uh, floor plan, they moved out. And this is one of the reasons uh, why the, the floor plans get like deep wings into the block. So the, the, the building uh, enhanced in, in the depth of the block this is one of the main reasons. And as I said, Munich was really uh, riddling how, how to get on with, with the development because there were many uh, people who need flats or like uh, quarters for, for living. And there was a plan by Zinetti, uh, um, as you can see here, uh, this is like uh, the, the old town. This is what have been built so far. And uh, they used the grid at these times to enhance uh, the, uh, the development for the, uh, for the districts, which was quite not so clever because the, the landowners were really unsatisfied with the situation because uh, the grid ignored every plot uh, that existed. And so Munich was one of the first towns in Europe um, who did a, a big competition on, on an urban development. Barcelona was the first one and everybody knows the Serda plan. So Munich was the second one in Europe. And uh, I just mentioned it because uh, the, the entry by Karl Henrici was really had, had quite an impact on the further development of, of the whole town. So he proposed, as you see in the picture, or oh, it's, it's a bit unclear, but maybe uh, you can see it. He proposed a, a, a growth in, in every direction and, and he, um, used the idea of Camino City, which we uh, see as the next picture or image uh, of, of the, of the he, he, he likes to imply a, a, a development that, that uh, implies that it, it's a grown city. It's, it's not like the grid, it, it's, it's a grown city. And as you can see here, he proposes uh, sub-centers for, for the districts and for the areas. Uh, he even had quite a more detailed uh, view or idea about them. It's, it's like uh, churches that uh, stand near squares or like public buildings uh, and that have like the main facade to the square. And if you take a closer look on the, on the images uh, below on the, on the side plans, you may maybe recognize that it's not far away from Camilo City and that, that is, uh, as I mentioned, where it comes from. Milo City published his uh, popular book, uh, City Planning According to Artistic Principles in 1889, where he really changed a lot for in, in urban planning. So as I said, until now, until this uh, time, or um, until this year, the, the, the urban planning was, was a kind of a two-dimensional tool. They, they used grids, it was very geometrical. And Camilo City was the first one who put the, the urban planning on, on, on a 3D scale. So he made analysis mostly of, uh, of Italian uh, spatial situations, analyzed them and uh, take out some, some conclusio of them. So this changed everything. And here comes uh, the hero of Munich. It's, it's Theodor Fischer. He's really the, <laughs> the guy who changed the whole game in Munich. This is the leading Wohnheim. It's by the way, uh, a typical building for the, for the, we call it the Munich way. It's, it's between traditionalism and, and modernism. It's, it's an own kind of, of, of style or direction. And it's really great. And Theodor Fischer was called to, to, to city council to, to uh, develop a plan for the, for the further development uh, of Munich because like the competition, there were, I think, four, four winners, but uh, there was no further um, working with those plans. So Theodor Fischer took over 
And he did uh, something really magnificent. He uh, developed the Staffelbau plan. A staffel is like, a, like the stories, like the height of the stories. Um, and you see, you, you, it's kind of like, uh, what uh, Henrici proposed. He um, did go in every direction with the plan. And uh, one thing about the colors is that he proposed, uh, he had, um, um, we call it Staffeln. It, it's like these classes of buildings or building system. There was uh, there were five classes in the, in the closed system. So the five buildings, how they should work in a block and uh, five uh, building classes, uh, how the buildings uh, could work in a, in a uh, single standing building. And this is uh, what is so uh, fantastic about this plan. So now the colors have a kind of deeper sense. So he could control, or he did control with these uh, uh, coloring the, the depth and the density of, of, of the city, of, of the new uh, areas or districts. And what we see here is, is a really uh, oh, a, a, a nice image that uh, where you can see that in yellow it's the old grid by uh, Zinetti, which really ignored the, the plots. And, and here these fine gray lines are the plots uh, like they used to be. And the yellow grid really denies every plot. So you really get uh, like uh, useless pieces of, 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 of rest plots like, like, like uh, yeah, they are cut really ridiculously. And Theodore Fischer now, I think it is more or less in his uh, invention, he used these plots to, to start uh, to uh, apply uh, Camilo Cite's uh, idea of, of, of urban planning, of, of, of on urban development. Um, so, so he did achieve two things. So the, the, the landowners were really happy because like the plots are, are used uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a good manner. And uh, where, where there was nothing, he, he applied uh, the, the idea of a, of a grown city and it, it really worked well. And, and I think this is his main achievement. So uh, this is like a, a typical scene from, from the um, district of Schwabing nowadays and you really have the feeling uh, that you walk through a grown city like an old city that uh, has developed but uh, in the end it, it really has <laughs> has been built uh, in, in, in 10 to 20 years and it's, it's all about the imagination that Theodore Fischer had so it was it was built on the green field more or less um, the kind of interesting thing is that they first built the corner buildings or the corner residential buildings because they uh, set the worth of the whole uh, block. So they marked the block and then the investor uh, could say uh, how much worth uh, the block would have. Um, yeah, and as I said, uh, Kurz was doing his diploma in Munich and he did a few competitions. Uh, eventually uh, won a few of them but didn't uh, actually build them uh, but in 1980 he, he did win a competition for a church and uh, together with Edward Herbert he uh, founded his office. Uh, Edward Herbert just for a short explanation he was the part uh, in the office who did take care of all the construction of the building sites or yeah he, he was the, the, the uh, pragmatic uh, part of the uh, office and Otto Landekurz was more or less the, the designer, the, he was in all the committees, uh, he was the connector for the office and I, I think most of the projects go back to his, uh, his ideas. So in 1908 he started uh, until 1914, uh, which is quite clear because then the first world war began and we start with a with an example of, of the Agnesstraße, which is quite in the center of, of Schwabing, um, which is interesting. Uh, well, a thing that is interesting is that in, in these six years, you have to imagine that Otto Landekurs was really a young architect and, and he managed to build uh, about 50 residential buildings, just residential buildings, in these first six years, which is quite amazing uh, from my point of view as a young architect. 
and he was much younger than I was, uh, than I am. So what is interesting about the Agnestrasse, or generally at, at the building process in, in Schwabing that, that he uh, controlled, is that he had through, through a kind of luck, or we don't know eventually, but we think it's, it, it also depends on, on his background, and because the family was very uh, popular and was well connected in Munich. So he had the opportunity to build more than one plot. So, so he built, uh, in this case, uh, uh, more, more plots that are joined to each other. And therefore he had uh, really on an early stage of his career the, the chance to, to experiment with the big forms of, of urban uh, layouts, which is quite amazing. So this is what I, what I told you before. This is like the typical floor plan. And it is not typical, but there's like one front house uh, that, that is directly uh, facing the street and there's, there's a deeper wing that uh, uh, um, keeps all the, the, the rooms for the servants and especially here we have in, in, the, in the backbone of the building, so to say, that there are uh, uh, like the cheaper flats and ateliers for the artists. Um, at first, uh, when we see the, the, this layout of the floor plan, we were really amazed about these courtyards because it's like really easy to see uh, that it's a back-to-back -back typology and this was some some way that he, he manages that the, the typology gets a really a, a well-dimensioned courtyard by connecting two of them or like uh, here it's, it's four of them um, which is just possible or made possible by the by the adjoining Plots. And we thought, oh, it's, 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 it's his invention, in, in invention, and we were really lucky to uh, find it. But, but then we find out that it's really in the, in the building law, and they made a, um, a research on how the, the free, or the, like the courtyard zone can, can be developed or have to be connected. And so it, it's not really an in, in intervention by Kurtz, but uh, he's one of the few who um, applied it. From the street view, you can see that that's what I said in the beginning, that he's really had the opportunity to, to experiment with these big uh, facade compositions. So this, these are all houses done by him. And there's, there's no relationship between the two connected houses uh, with the courtyard and the outer appearance to the street. He's more going for a, for a, a for one building at the corner, then there's a building with a setback, then you have connect three buildings together, then there's another house with a setback, and then there comes again a house that goes to the front. And which is quite amazing, and this is, to be honest, the, the, the house that took us on the, on the research, of course, because it was on my way on, on <laughs> I was passing by, by uh, with my bicycle uh, every day, and I was asking myself, why is this house so unmunic? It's, it's really like uh, a strange house in, 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 in a kind of way. And it has some Italo elements like these, these uh, uh, layers or like the, you, you see it as a, as a filter towards the street, uh, like the loggia to the street. And then he makes a complete step back uh, on the uh, third and uh, on the second and third floor. Uh, to, to give uh, like uh, the, the house next to it uh, more uh, importance. And we, we really liked the way that the facade was, was not like the other facades in Munich, uh, which was another thing which is quite uh, interesting that he puts always or often goes for the, for the middle of the building, which is very untypical for Munich. Most Munich buildings have like a ground floor that is articulated then there comes the main facade and then there comes the roof and, and it's always like changes these uh, 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 system or like systems here. Yeah. So and another thing which is quite interesting that through this layer in the first two floors he was like making a bit of a distance to the street and then through the setback he, he manages to, to in our opinion to, to get the, the space from the street or connect it somehow more with the house. Then he chooses to do bay windows uh, to get again a view into the street. 
And another house, uh, this is the first house with the setback we saw before in the big facade, which is quite a clever arranged. Um, is you put on the on the firewalls like two uh, bay window rooms on this side and this side and make another setback, which gives the house like a special appearance. Maybe you can find it in Munich on, on bigger scaled houses, but not on, on such a small residential building house, uh, such a small residential building. What, what we quite like, and it, it, it's kind of, 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 of a Fritz mannerism, he always, or, or, a, a lot of times there's a portico, and in this portico there's again a small entrance uh, uh, included. Um, so so he, he is always going for these multi-layered uh, zones of the houses. For the floor plans, we have to say that my, today they are really, uh, Beautiful flats, oh, but uh, there's no no such a such an idea or bigger idea behind them, uh, with the exception of the courtyards, which, which is quite uh, uh, some some novelty. Um, in these times, it was we found a lot of articles where it was like uh, the it, it is said that the the architect does the whole building or was was planning the whole building, but in the end. The, the architect was just doing the facade, and uh, the, the floor plan has been done by the by the building company. So they did not really pay attention. To him. We, we we have to say that we think that Kurz does his floor plans on his own in these times. But as you can see here, it, it's really it comes together with the mass of the other floor plans. This is a, a, a compilation of floor plans done by Alois Bora uh, in 1912, and Kurz is really uh, uh, in between this, these floor plans, he's, he's not an exception. Then at the, we just take, a, take out a few buildings because like on every building we can dive really deeply into, but, but uh, I'd like to show you the whole spectrum of, of buildings he did. This is the last building he did before the First World War began. Again, it, it's, it's, it's a building which, which does some some, some things uh, a Munich building does not. But as you can see, and here it, it's really clear, um, Kurz was educated in, 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 a, in, a, in a manner of historism. Or there's, there's a lot of, of elements that, that uh, uh, yeah, relate to the historism in this time. Uh, so at the Polytechnical University where he was educated, uh, the Tiersch brothers were really teaching like uh, Gothic, style and, and uh, baroque style and the thing that from, from our view now is, is a bit ridiculous that it, it, we found a no, uh, notice that Kutz, Kutz does a competition of a church and uh, they were asked in the competition to do the church in a gothic style so uh, he was forced to do it in a, in, in a gothic style. Um, again you can see here that but this, yeah, these are like now, uh, this is the building we just saw. One, one half of the building was bombed in the Second World War, so it, it was completely demolished. Uh, it's a pity because like the building really works <laughs> with, the, uh, with the second half of the building uh, and the courtyard system. These are buildings he did, that, uh, did in, the, in the first period as well. And this is like the first building he did in the second period. If you take a closer uh, view at the floor plan, he, there's still kind of development in the floor plan. He was really keen on um, using, oh, sorry, the floor plans economically. And it's again, these, these thinking, if you th see these buildings nowadays, you think oh, it's, it's so beautiful and they are just uh, dr driven by aesthetics, but uh, to be honest, it's, it's everything about the economics and the usage of the plot. So there, there's always uh, the try, especially by Kurz and Eduard Herbert, to, to maximize the volume. And in this case, he managed this by uh, applying two courtyards who uh, serve uh, the, the, the flats and one smaller courtyard that was split up or like uh, separated or used by both houses uh, that served the servants' room. And as we say, Kurz was really on, on, a, on a way to, to 
experiment with the facades. He was he was like collaging his old facades. This is one facade that we uh, can see at the Umstrasse in 1910. It's near the English Garden. We again introduces uh, the middle and this small, uh, very special roof. It's not very, uh, seen very often in Munich. Or another uh, example is the Hildensberger Straße in 1912, where uh, it goes more for the, again for the roof, but on a lower position, and again these bay windows. Um, it's clear that, that he starts to experiment and, and collage these things. Oh, this uh, house was a very, on, a, on a very uh, prominent position. It was close to the, uh, like uh, on the other side of the street, there was the River Isar. So it has to be a very, how to say, muscleless building, a prominent building. Um, after this building, Kurz was called to service uh, on, on the World War. And he had big luck because he was on a, on a uh, group of, of uh, soldiers that uh, were uh, saving and conserving art in Italy. So he was not really on, on the art battlefield, so to say. And uh, after a few years, he luckily was called back uh, to uh, enhance an in, in, in industrial site for BMW. It was really also building uh, war machines, I think. And this was quite good for him because uh, a lot of offices were really had no, no projects after the first World War and Kurz was really had the chance to have this big project and do again uh, residential buildings. Uh, this is the first building he did after the first World War and there's a slight change in the appearance, as you may notice, the, the, the his, historic decor or like the historism and the decor of the historism is, is getting a bit more reduced. There's still the, like the, the, the ground floor zone that goes with the, uh, with the horizontal plaster texture. And there are these strange <laughs> elements, we really like them because like in Munich they are regularly uh, a minimum of, of three stories high and here they are more like dots on the facade and make an own rhythm uh, on the facade. And now we, we, we are taking a closer look at this building. Uh, the, this plot uh, was just made possible by uh, uh, adding three plots together. And again, Kurz was, was driven by uh, economy to, to really maximize the volume he can build. He was able to ignore a lot of building laws, especially uh, concerning the clearance area. So it, normally it's not possible to build such a long firewall on the, on the frontier of the plot. Uh, uh, he just made it possible while uh, saying that he's building uh, a lot of flats in this building, so he could uh, skip some, some building use and because there was a, a big lack of flats after the First World War. Here we see an uh, axonometric drawing of the building, which is to, uh, about the front facade we just talked. Uh, in the back you can see that there's a, spe a special thing that, that he uh, integrated into the courtyard. It's, it's uh, like a layer of, of uh, oh, sorry, sometimes, a, a layer of, 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 a, of a, a stacked lodger. And again, he, it starts to, that, that the, he thinks about how, how the rooms can take part or can, can, can have an advantage of this special zone view. And, it's again something very, very uncommon in Munich uh, because like most of the courtyards are just courtyards and maybe you have balconies, but you don't have such, an, such a big element as, as you may see here. Um, it's, for us, it's again an evidence that the, the, there's a, really a relationship uh, with the Italian architecture where he grew up and there's still, still an impact on the buildings. And again, it's uh, this classical layout uh, that the, the rooms for the, for the uh, more expensive flats are like facing towards the street and like uh, the cheaper flats are in the back of the building. Now we come to the um, part, as you, as you may have noticed that, that now he's building uh, not really on small plots, he's like starts building uh, fragments of a block or like pieces of a block, 
with such big urban houses. The, what we think is quite amazing, of course, maybe it's by luck, maybe, uh, yeah, that he started with really smaller projects where he can experiment and now, uh, while his career is developing, uh, there's an analogy to, to, to the size of the building that are also do bigger and, and he can use all the knowledge he gathered in, in, the, in the building phases before. So this is the Simonstraße, they go, here we have it, and it goes together with the rhein mainzer Straße. The buildings were completely built at the same time, but there's a, quite a, a difference between them because the Simonstraße, uh, he used the vocabulary of, of, a, of, a, of a bourgeois building we can see here. He wanted to enhance the middle part of, uh, so as you can see in the floor plan, he did not really accept uh, the, the, the plot so he just uh, cut the, the winged building or the, the, the two wings of the main building, as he said, uh, and uh, added some facade uh, to, to the main building. So it, it gets more important and it, it gets more like a, like a grandezza. And he uh, added this, uh, I don't know what it's called in English, it's a risalit in, in Germany. So it really marks the middle of the building and, and it gives us the whole building like this this this, this strange in, strange in appearance uh, and again he, he's make, making as in theodor fischer staffelbau plan we have a, a garden zone in the front of the building and as he wanted to enhance or, or exaggerate uh, this part of the building he makes another uh, five meters uh, as a step back so uh, it gets more space and again he, he tries to put the, the space of the street uh, to, to combine it into the building or to, 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 yeah, to, to get the space of the street into the building. And another aspect which is quite interesting is that, that he goes for, for a kind of, again, Italo motif planning. There's a pergola at the entrance and again, also in, in the back of the courtyard there's some elements who uh, Thing, uh, to uh, like make, make reference to the Italian architecture. And in, in, in contrary, there is the, the Rhein-Mainzer Straße, which really now goes into the Neue Sachlichkeit or in a way to, to modernism, which is really a, a hard urban setting here, but we really like it because it's, it's very strict and somehow to try. And you can see here that now Kurz is going for, for some elements. Uh, Winfried Nerdinger described them as, as, as false modernism, but uh, he, he saw, we guess he saw somewhere the, the, the corner windows, like the band windows, and he tried to imitate them. He was not capable of doing them because like the, all these uh, buildings are for sure built with brick, but they were the first uh, tries to, to imitate uh, a kind of modernism in these buildings. For sure, in, in the roof, uh, there was not quite intention to, to imitate a flat roof, so, so there was really no, no uh, he had really, uh, in the design process, no access to it. Here again, uh, the rhein mainzer Straße from the side. And again, you see here, uh, these like elements, this is for the staircase that, that you know maybe from Mendelssohn in Berlin, who did a lot of, of residential buildings. And I think this is one of the reasons why Kurz is just architect of the second world. He, he had some, some own interventions, but uh, in the end, he, he was the second world because like, he was a bit trying to copy the things and trying to, to imitate uh, a modernity. In the end, in our opinion, he reached modernity, but we come to this later. And on the inner courtyard as well, this, this, we have to imagine Munich is, <laughs> I would say, up to now. It's very baroque and fatigue. It's a very slow city still. I think this is the baroque uh, uh, feeling here in Munich. And it was very, very hard to apply new things in Munich because like the, the, the people don't, don't want to have new things. So this was really amazing for Munich in, 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 in these times. But as you, again, 
if you look internationally, what happened on, on, on other uh, cities, it, it's quite uh, in the scheme. And this is uh, the, the last um, step he did. Um, the, uh, the office enhanced and he, from 1926 to 1933, he uh, managed to almost build whole blocks or uh, at least areas. And it was uh, what is the last phase of, of building. He, he uh, tragically died in 1933 of, uh, he was shaving and uh, got a, a blood poison. I don't know what it's called in English, but uh, he died really young. Um, and now we really uh, 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 lose all the decor, as you can see here. This is the Schleißheimer Karl Theodor Straße. And he applies some, some style elements of, of, the, of the modernism. He maybe, as we said before, uh, found in, in magazines. Or, but he's still very keen on, on doing, uh, like on the first entrance building in, a, in another expression, but still is keen on, on, on finding special ways to en, uh, um, enhance the entrance, to, to articulate the entrance uh, of the building towards the street. And this is really <laughs> amazing because like, especially on this side, he had the chance to, to build a whole area. So there's uh, one of the two first modern churches uh, that he built in these times. This is uh, St. Sebastian, the other church is St. Gabriel, it's more or less on the other side of Munich, but these are uh, well-known churches in Munich. But this church builds the center of the, of the whole area. And now, now he starts reacting with the, with the residential blocks towards this church. It's, there's like a, a square in the front of the church and the one block goes almost uh, uh, until this, uh, square, the other one makes a step back, and which is an uh, interesting thing that is that he opened the, the blocks to the south, and this is a very rare situation, I mean, if, if you pass the blocks, it's very surprising that, that you get a, like a really deep view into a block, which, which uh, shows you the size of the block. And then between these two blocks, he has again this garden zone um, with, a, with a more quiet street, and so here he starts to develop a kind of language for the urban settings uh, according to the, to the usage of the streets. Oh, there, there's a, like, this is the, the main street, so the, the facade really keeps calm. You just see an image here. Oh, this is the whole situation. You can see the north building we just are going to view a few minutes later. Yeah, as a, in, in make a, a, a low, he lowered the building towards the square so the church gets a bit more space. And here you see the facade. It's, it's, it's really a clear facade. There's not any more, uh, not, not any more, any elements of the, of the historic, historic style or historicism. As we found out that there's a, there's a really good book uh, from Wolfgang Pien about the German uh, expressionism. And now Kurz uh, applies elements of, the, of these uh, expressionism. It's, it's called the triangle expressionism. It's really obvious why it's called like this. And also these uh, bay windows uh, are really uh, part as well of the expressing thing. Now, now everything, and we think it's, it's the most interesting um, part of his work because like he's now mixing up uh, all these things. And this is the Northern block, uh, which we think is the most advanced block in this uh, whole area. So there's, there's the, the harsh, Facade or very uh, yeah, like clear facade to the street with a with the uh, triangle um, bay windows. Then there comes the step back because uh, on the other side of the street the uh, church, and then on on the on the smaller street he starts to to fragmentize the facade. So this is once again the the view for on the main street. As you can see, there was not so many traffic, but. <laughs> Uh, still developing. This is the southern residential building and here uh, as we saw in the floor plan you have the three uh, bay windows and this was really the key facade. It was really like positioning uh, it towards the street and then if you turn around the building there's a completely uh, 
other appearance of the building. It's, it's more fragmentized, it's, 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 it's more composed, and it, it's, on a whole, it's, it's much more appealing to the size of the street, which, which was a, a street of a second hierarchy, which was smaller. And again, the, the entrance, uh, what I told you before, that, that it was detailing still the entrances, but, but again, in a, in a changed way towards a, a modernism or expressionism. And this is finally the building where we think he reached in, in, in his thinking a modern kind of building. I think the first one, uh, the first modern building in Munich was uh, from Robert Vorhelzer. It was the post at the Silverhornstraße. And if you uh, take a look at it, it's really uh, not far away from this building. It was a huge block uh, who was uh, the, the end of the Dölgas Siedlung. Dölgas was also a, a very famous or popular architect in Munich who did uh, most, mostly known from, for the renovation, the refurbishment of the Alte Pinakothek after the Second World War. And he was he did the master plan for this for the Dölgas Siedlung, and Kurz did get uh, this block to develop. And here he really was like uh, put out the full force of the block. It was it was really a clear block. Sorry, it was really clear. It's just a few manipulations which we really like because uh, they make the building a bit special and and uh, somehow uh, yeah characterized the building with this setback here. But it was mainly like a, a serialized floor plan. And um, from the outer appearance, it was really like the modern building in Munich. You can see here, there's still some, some nice detailing because uh, on the top, the corner is, uh, say, rounded. And uh, on the balconies, it's, it's, it's a corner. And, Again, we have these these balconies. They were like a, like in the zeitgeist of the time. So again, this is why Kurz is not not the the, the architect of the first room. For the conclusion in our book, uh, we think that the we call it the in between. It was the the style he developed, as I said before, uh, until he did his last building where he was experimenting, collaging things uh, in the appearance of the buildings. And even he was starting to think more about the floor plans. And for us, the, the best example is the mold block. Uh, it's, it's a big uh, residential block uh, uh, next to the Theresienwiese, where the Oktoberfest is taking part, except for this year. And I think here you can see what, what Otto Lannekurz really was capable to do as an architect. This was the layout that he uh, would get from Theodor Fischer. Theodor Fischer, as the master planner, was, was drawing uh, like uh, for every side such a plan. So how the, the building should develop. This building was done by Theodor Fischer himself. This residential block, this was the residential block that Kurz should develop. And this was a block that uh, Viva Wegwerth uh, uh, are going to build. And as you, as you see, this, in our opinion, <laughs> Fisher's out here, but this is a bit clumsy. Or it's, it's like just uh, like the first uh, sketch of the building uh, could be. And Kurtz really developed it in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. This is the building from an aerial view. You see again to the, to the, to the biggest street. It has a facade that is really clear, that has a, a rhythm. I said sometimes it, it reminds of, of Kai Fisco, of these, of these long facades that really stay in, in, a, in, a, in a very good sense, naive, but, but are very uh, um, robust. You see the whole layout, and what we like especially, or we think that the, the building is showing the best, that on the corners, he did some some urban uh, solutions that or spatial solutions that really are amazing. So we take a look at, at this corner. He just in, in, again in a good way naively put out the volume and uh, intersected it uh, over the other volume. And on the one hand, he did really get a, a, a like a like a very strong corner solution, 
which also manages to, to get a connection with the Theodore Fisher building here at this corner. And on the same time, he did manage to, to uh, introduce the garden zone on, on this side, which is really important because like this is again a, a street of a second hierarchy. And so he, he really did pay attention uh, on, on the, on the to say on the, yeah, on the size of the student, on, on the dimension. And this is uh, like the situation on the south where maybe like the, your first intention, if, if you have to draw such a building, you would say, oh, if it, if it gets so thin, the building, you have to enhance it, you make it thick, but he uh, uh, actually did uh, the opposite of it. He really fragmentized the building. He uh, make it like a thin wall, or as you can see here, there's really a thin, you can look through, there was the entrance. He was one of the architects who believed in, in, the, in the car. So he was introducing one of the first uh, uh, underground parking solutions in Munich. And we really like how, how he, he solves the, the architectural questions on such uh, big buildings on, in, in a very own way of thinking, in a way of the spatial thinking. We don't care so much about what the vocabulary uh, was that he used. It's more like the, the urban planning that was really, really, really good. And that, uh, this is what I said before that, that he now did again, or also did pay attention to the, to the flats as they were strictly serialized flats from uh, like built <laughs> hundreds of times. He invented uh, such a, such a uh, corridor figure and we were lucky to, to receive from the owner some original pictures, which really make like a, a separation between the public zone and the private zone. And through the corridor here, he, he manages to get natural light in, into this corridor. So it's really a development in, in, in such a serialized floor plan. And this is maybe the final picture. It's, it's uh, on the cover of the book. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's by Farno, uh, residential building, but we liked it because it's, it's for us, it's, it's the, the idea of, of Kutz and what, what for us was most important in, in this in-between, how, how he uh, collaged things. And as, as you can see, this is like uh, the first few, uh, you think it's a two-story building, but these like are two stories and he always stays with the scales and again with the dimension. So thank you for the attention and uh, thank you to the Architectural Foundation. Oh, well, thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, thanks for such a brilliantly detailed um, presentation. Um, I think we have a question from um, Vic Bogart. I'm just going to unmute you. Mm. Okay, it's not working for now. Oh, yeah, you're unmuted now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're unmuted now, Vic. Hi, yeah, um, I have a question about the um, uh, small triangle or um, yeah, I think they're mostly triangular, small windows um, at the top story. Uh, what is behind them? Is ah. it like a functional uh, ah. story or? No, it, 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 was, it was more or less. Ah. It, it, was, it was, oh no, I have an echo, sorry. <laughs> It, it was just for, for functional uh, things that it was used to dry uh, the, the, the wet uh, clothes. It, it was just a storage room. So he used it as a, in the outer appearance, he used it as a, as a for his composition, but uh, uh, from the interior point of view, there was, was, uh, it was really unimportant. It was funny for him because like, uh, in, uh, the example where he used the triangle window, he was, uh, I forgot to say, he was uh, found a way to, to imitate the flat roof. He was not capable of building it, it's still uh, uh, incline, uh, uh, slow, uh, uh, like, a, like a very low inclined roof uh, behind a wall, like an Attica, but uh, it, it was not really a true flat roof. Yeah, I just had to mute um, Vic just because of the echo, but yeah, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> Um, I think Ellis has a question now. Thanks, Sebastian. It was wonderful. Um, could you just give us a little bit of back, uh, background about the 
the development of social housing in Munich? I mean, I'd understood that the, the projects you were showing today were really all, all, certainly the early ones, but were they all for the, the commercial sector, essentially? Was, I mean, this is obviously a very different situation from, say, in Vienna, where there's a kind of, uh, you know, a, a lot of energy going into state subsidized housing. But um, who who was who were the were the, were the clients kind of were they um, we, we was he working in the social housing sector too or, is it, or did that not exist as such during this period? Not as strong as as it in Vienna because Vienna has a really big culture on social housing and it was really connected to a political uh, idea uh, uh, till the end it, uh, and, and some 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 of these social houses really work like fortresses as, and, and they were, <laughs> were working as fortresses sometimes. So in, in Munich, there's, I think there has always been a lot of money and puts really to build for, 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 for the well, well earning, uh, say, people. But there was a, was a really ridiculous uh, fact uh, about the first houses I showed you. Um, uh, they, there was such a such a such a low capacity on 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 flats uh, at those times that they actually they did not need uh, the houses for for the for the well-paying owner they actually needed for the for the workers so uh, they started to to rent these houses to three or more families so every family moved in into one room which was quite too dense and a long time these houses work like this so they don't work like the the bourgeois house with the, with the rooms to the street so they were more like uh, social housing but they were not not meant to be and it i i was sent seeing flashes of um red vienna and some of the detailing i mean you yeah you yeah that, that he was aware of karl marx off say or uh but yeah would there be a who, and, and you mentioned Fisker as, as a kind of a point of reference. So he, um, he must evidently have been conscious of housing cultures outside of Munich and, and looking very attentively at magazines, I imagine. Yeah, this, is, this was a big question for us. And it's a pity that we, we, we did not, or there, there's not uh, a lot of, of, of personal uh, notices or letters left from him. It's, it's really. Uh, everything we did to get to know about him was, was in the book of his aunt. And, but there they say he's really, he's an architect, but uh, he's really a, a kind of economic architect. He was, was really keen of what he was doing. And I don't know if, if he was interested so much in this, this housing debate. He was really keen on, on building. And to be honest, we, we don't know actually if, if he would have died tragically of, of his uh, blood infection while shaving because after 1933 the, the times or like the, 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 the directions really split up from the bad and all the, all the good ones could go away and we are not sure if, if, if he would have chosen the bad one because there was like one competition where, where he was um, uh, building um, a site for, 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 for the uh, on, on the Phoenix Platz and it had quite a, a, a touch of a, of a very uh, nationalism kind of architecture. So, yeah. Well, the, when you were showing photographs, historic photographs of projects, aerial photos, black and white buildings, are, the, are those projects that were destroyed in the war generally? Or, or? no, this is the good thing. Um, at the end of the book, you put uh, up a, a, a big catalog of all the buildings because most of the buildings uh, survived the Second World War. And we see the book also as a part of a guide to a certain part of the history of Munich. So you can really walk to every building and take a look at it. And most of the buildings are uh, under, how do you say it? Uh, conservation surveillance. Yeah. <laughs> and so they, they won't be changed uh, uh, in their appearance, or um, and, and they are still loved by their by their inhabitants. We we we, we did manage to get in a lot of, of the uh, flats, and it's amazing because uh, in, in nowadays you, you can't make make a corridor such big, and they have really nice dimensions. So this is what I 
said before. So even if, if it's a it's, it's a floor plan, a regular floor plan that was built maybe a thousand times, these these flats really work very well. I thought your your talk made a very nice companion with a couple of other ones we've had in the series. Karen Templin talking about the London Mansion block, and Hans van der Hayden talking about brick built Rotterdam from the 30s through the 50s. Kind of all in each case really presenting this economically driven, very intelligent architecture, but that's sort of been overlooked and and you know absolutely essential to the the creation of those respective cities, but um, somehow. You know, it hasn't been thought of as part of the canon in the past. Um, we've just got one more question um, from LW. I'm just going to meet you now, if you want to ask it. Okay, well, I will ask it for LW. Um, so he or she says, um, what's the relationship with the Bauhaus and German modernism, what's the implication to the present Munich urban residential development? We think, as I said, that the Munich is very Baroque and fatigue and very slow moving. So this, this is the most modernism you can get into Munich, so, or that was built in Munich. Because after, as I said, in 1933, there was like a, a, a like a, how you say, there were two ways and one really led into another direction. They like on, under the Nazi regime, they did really go back to traditionalism. Also, Theodor Fischer was really kicked out, and he he, he did turn on the good side. He really uh, <laughs> had to give a speech on what he think about Nazi architecture. <laughs> after this, he did not build uh, any any building, but it's really good what he said. And I think this this was the start and the end at the same time of modernism in Munich. 